Hi folks, this is Jason. I hope you're okay today. We're looking at a book um, which is um, an old book that uh, was written by the Reverend C. Robertson uh, many, many years ago. Um, and it's in the public domain and you can freely use and distribute it. And um, so I'm going to read an extract on Ignatius. So here's the extract. And I uh, hope you find it a blessing. When our Lord ascended into heaven, he left the government of his church to the apostles. We are told that during the 40 days between his rising from the grave and his ascension, he gave commandments unto the apostles and spoke of the things belonging to the kingdom of God. Acts chapter 1 verse 2. Thus they knew that they were to do when their master should be no longer with them. And one of the first things which they did, even without waiting until his promise of sending the Holy Ghost should be fulfilled, was to choose St. Matthias into the place which he had been left empty by the fall of the traitor Judas. Acts chapter 1 15, 26. After this we find the appointed other persons to help them in their work. First they appointed the deacons to take care of the poor, to assist themselves, then they appointed presbyters or elders to undertake the charge of congregations. Afterwards we find St. Paul sending Timothy to Ephesus and Titus into the island of Crete, with power to ordain elders in every city, Titus 1.5, and to govern all the churches within a large country. Thus then these three kinds of orders of ministers of the church are mentioned in the Acts of the Epistles. The deacons are Lois, the presbyters or elders, etc. One of the most famous among the early bishops was Saint Ignatius, Bishop of Antioch, the place where the disciples were first called Christians. Acts chapter 11, verse 26. Acts was the chief city of Syria and was so large that it had more than 200,000 inhabitants. Saint Peter himself said to have been its bishop for some years. And although this is perhaps a mistake, it is worth remembering because we shall find by and by that much was said about the bishops of Antioch being St. Peter's successors as well as the bishops of Rome. Ignatius had known St. John and was made bishop of Antioch about 30 years before the apostle's death. He had governed his church for 40 years or more when the emperor Trajan came to Antioch in the Roman history. Trajan is described as one of the best among the emperors, but he did not treat the Christians well. He seems never to have thought that the gospel possibly be true, and thus he did not take the trouble to inquire what the Christians really believed or did. They were obliged in those days to hold their worship in this secret, and mostly by night or very early in the morning, because it would not have been safe to meet openly. And hence the heathens who did not know what was done at their meetings were tempted to fancy all manner of shocking things, such as that that the Christians practiced magic, that they worshipped the head of an ass, that they offered children in sacrifice, and that they ate humans in flesh. It is not likely that the Emperor Trajan believed such foolish tales as these, and when he did make some inquiry about the ways of the Christians, he heard nothing but what was good of them, but still he might think that there was some mischief behind, and he might fear lest the secret meetings of the Christians should have something to do with the plots against his government, and so, as I have said, he was no friend to them. When Trajan came to Antioch, St. Ignatius, just was carried before him. The emperor was asked what evil spirit possessed him so that he not only broke the laws by refusing to serve the gods of Rome but persuaded others to do the same. Ignatius answered that he was not possessed by any evil spirit, that he was a servant of Christ and that by his help he defeated the malice of evil spirits and that he bore his God and Saviour within his heart. After some more questions and answers the emperor ordered that he should be carried in chains to Rome and that should be devoured by wild beasts. When Ignatius heard this terrible sentence, he was so far from being frightened that he burst forth into thankfulness and rejoicing because he was allowed to suffer to his saviour and for the deliverance of his people. It was a long and toilsome journey over land and sea from Antioch to Rome, and an old man such as Ignatius was ill able to bear it, especially as winter was coming on. He was to be chained too, and the soldiers who had the charge of him behaved very rudely and crudely to him, and no doubt the emperor thought that 
that by sending so venerable in this way to suffer so fearful and so disgraceful a death to which the only lowest wretches were usually sentenced, he should terrify other Christians in forsaking their faith. But instead of this, the courage and the patience with which St. Ignatius bore his sufferings gave the Christian fresh spirit to endure whatever might come to them. The news that the Holy Bishop of Antioch was to be carried to Rome soon spread and at many places on the way the bishops, clergy and people flocked together that they might see him and pray and talk with him and receive his blessing. And when he could find time, he wrote letters to various churches, exhorting them to stand fast in the faith, to be at peace among themselves, to obey the bishops who were set over them, and to advance in holy living. One of the letters was written to the church at Rome and was sent on by some persons who were traveling by a shorter way, St. Ignatius begs, in this letter that the Romans will not try to save him from death. I am the wheat of God, he says, may be ground by the teeth of the beast, that I may be found the pure bread of Christ. Rather do you encourage the beast that they may become my tomb, and may leave nothing of my body, so that when dead I may not be troublesome to anyone. He even said that if the lion should hang back, he would himself provoke them to attack him. It would not be right for ordinary people to speak in this way, and the church is always disproved of those who threw themselves in the way of persecution. But a holy man who had served God for so many years as Ignatius might well speak in a way which could not become ordinary Christian. When he was called to die for his people and for the trough, tr for Christ, he might even take as a token of God's favour, and might long for his deliverance from the troublesome of the trials of the world. And St. Paul said himself that he had desired to depart to be with Christ. He reached Rome just in time for some games which were to take place a little before Christmas, for the Romans were cruel enough to amuse themselves with setting wild beasts used to tear and devour men in vast places called amphitheatres at their public games. When the Christians of Rome heard that Ignatius was near the city, great numbers of them went out to meet him, and they said that they would try to persuade the people in the amphitheatre to see that he might not be put to death. But he entreated, as he had before done in his letter, that they would do nothing to hinder him from glorifying God by his death. And he knelt down with them and prayed that they might continue in faith and love, and that the persecution might soon come to an end. As it was the last day of the games, and they were nearly over, he was then hurried into the amphitheatre called the Colosseum, which was so large that tens of thousands of people might look on, and in this place, of which he, the ruins are still to be seen, St. Ignatius was torn to death by wild beasts, so that only a few of his larger bones were left, which the Christians took up and conveyed to his own city of Antioch. That's the life of Ignatius. I hope that's been a blessing to you and an encouragement. May God bless you.